welcome everybody. Uh, like you said, uh, I don't know what time zone you're in that have, have lunch together or whatnot, but, uh, you know, wish I could obviously be uh, talking with you in person, but uh, know that the, the world that we're in, that I've been having a lot of virtual conversations about PPP and, and the ERC. So uh, as Dan said, the point of today is kind of give an update. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll go, over, go over some of the, the getting in the weeds on some things and, you know, I'm happy to answer questions, but yeah, please get your questions in as you go throughout. So we're going with the latest, as, as, as I've been saying, because I feel like it's, is we probably all come to appreciate almost constant, the some of the changes and what we've seen that's developed. And, and I mean, even down to, you know, making sure before we jumped on today that I was looking to see if there was any updates because they do come out daily, sometimes hourly, it feels like, and just wanting to kind of keep up to date on everything. And so that's my goal today is to kind of walk through some of that. So again, a uh, little bit more about me. I'll have a slide at the end too. Uh, if you want to reach out with questions, I am happy to do them. I also host a podcast about taxes, um, Simply Tax, which I always say is hopefully every bit as exciting as you would hope a podcast about taxes would be. Um, but we do try to make it uh, digestible and approachable. And we've covered such great topics as uh, Paycheck Protection Program and uh, the Employee Retention Credit. And uh, like I said, that's really what we're going to be focusing on today. It's kind of two items on the agenda. And your questions I have last, but again, please, throughout, you know, and Dan's going to help me here. Keep an eye on the chat and, and, uh, and let me know what questions we have that come in. So don't be shy. I think a good place to start is is really maybe with a level set. And there's a lot of acronyms on here, and it's mostly so that it can be digestible of looking at the legislation that we've seen in the course of about the last year, like I said, of um, you know response to the, the COVID-19 pandemic. And it, uh, really, the first thing that we saw was referred to as phase one commonly uh, was was a bill that was enacted on uh, on March 6th. So, yeah, we're, we're about rounding up on our uh uh, one year anniversary here, but but really where things got a little bit more, um, I'll say, you know, where the conversation really starts for our, even purposes of today is when we get to this this phase three here, uh, the CARES Act, which was uh, at the end of March. And that's where we got the Paycheck Protection Program and the current version of the, um, or I guess the initial version of the employee retention credit in this context, which was later modified. But then since then, uh, we've, we've seen a number of other things. We had a, a, an expansion of the PPP program after uh, the, the first dollars went in the tranche of dollars, that is, went very quickly. Um, then we had some, some very significant changes at the beginning of June. And, and I know that's when a lot of people started saying, oh, man, I'm starting to lose track of all these things, these changes already. Uh, but, but then we had an extension that was enacted on July 4th that took us out to August 8th. And the program shut down uh, for a bit there. But then we got to the end of, uh, of, of the year and with the spending bill, we had a number of other things. And we also had uh, the, um, the Appropriations Act attached to it was, was a number of changes to both the PPP and the ERC. Uh, and so that's, that's where we're gonna really try to pick up today and, and, and talk to the conversation. So what was in that, that thing more broadly? Uh, so again, the Consolidated Appropriations Act, and uh, this is where I, I, I promise to start getting getting a little bit more specific into the programs and not as broad brush, but I think it's helpful to set the table here. Um, so, like I said, the, the changes to the PPP was included um, or were included, I should say. Um, there are a number of provisions like the employee retention credit, but a number of others as well and um, a number of funding provisions. But what we're still looking at now, and, and I'm sure you're aware, so I think this is a good place to talk about it, is there is... Uh, another relief bill that is uh, that paves the path has been paved for it to go through uh, using budget reconciliation, which is a process in the Senate to get things through. So um, there there are some changes actually to the PPP there as well as to the the employer retention credit further. So the last last I'm kind of hearing again nobody has the crystal ball as to how it's going to work, but I know they're trying to get it out of the House uh, this week, and then um, they're they're looking to get it through the Senate uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, with a goal of trying to get it to uh, into place before the expiration of some of the un unemployment uh, benefits that expire at the beginning of March. So uh, we may see it again, I'll call them tweaks to the Paycheck Protection Program and the Employee Retention Credit uh, from where we are today, but just to kind of let you know that those are on the horizon as well. So let's start with the Paycheck Protection Program and we'll weave in a little bit of the Employee Retention Credit because as you'll come to see here, these things are pretty inter inter intertwined, I think, um, and you need to be thinking about them both. Um, so uh, with that, maybe again, just let's just level set, right? I'm, I'm 
pretty sure by now we all have the the three letters uh, PPP uh, on our mind, and and we're talking about them and hearing about them a lot, right? Uh, but just as a reminder, that is is actually an extension of or an expansion of the current seven A program uh, that the SBA has, and it's in, again because of that administered by the SBA and the Treasury. Um, and it, it really on its simplest basis, you're you're talking about a forgivable loan that. Uh, Basically, if you spend it for eligible payroll costs and non-payroll costs, then you get full forgiveness. Okay, fairly straightforward, right? And then we also know that uh, there's a couple of restrictions or limitations potentially on that um, forgiveness, and there's they kind of generally fall into three buckets. So, FTE meaning full-time equivalent reduction. So, if you reduce headcount, um, if you reduced wages uh, and how much you're paying people, um, and again we're going broad broad base here, right? Uh, and then the third is if you didn't spend at least 60 of it on payroll costs, uh, then you get limitation. So that's th th those are kind of the factors that, again, they think that there is a lot of nuance to. And that's where I'm hearing a lot of questions and helping with a lot of people going through the forgiveness process uh, for, for PPP1 at this point. Um, because, again, those loans were all generally most most people got them in April and, and their, their covered period, which is the t was extended to be 24 weeks. Um, generally ended in October for a lot of folks. So kind of working through those now, I will tell you that uh, if you if you have if you had a loan or you're working with people that have loans and they're not forgiven yet, it probably wouldn't be a loan. I, I think two thirds of the loans still have yet to be forgiven or getting into the, even to the uh, SBA process yet. Um, so although the, you know, the first round loans are generally done for, mo for a lot of people, uh, although there's some exceptions that we'll talk about, uh, forgiveness hasn't happened yet for everybody. So that's something to to keep an eye on. Um, and again, there'll be a lot more questions as you get into that forgiveness application. But uh, you can start applying for forgiveness anytime after the, the eight weeks, uh, which is the uh, now, uh, and this is a change that we'll get into, that the covered period was initially eight weeks. That's the time you have to spend the money. Uh, it was bumped up to 24. Now it can be anything between eight and 24 weeks. Uh, but you have to have at least eight weeks. So you can apply anytime thereafter. A common question I get is, well, when do I have to apply for forgiveness by? And technically the due date is the, the maturity of the loan. So as long as you apply for forgiveness, by the time that that loan matures, you're, you're in the clear. Now, from a practical perspective though, you're gonna have to start making payments 10 months after the end of your covered period. So if you have a 24 week covered period, then you, know, you go 10 months beyond that, that's when re the repayment period begins and you have to start making the payments uh, if you do subsequently get forgiven, you can, and you had to make payments in the interim, you, you can get those payments returned to you. Um, so I, I think from many practical perspectives of not having to, you know, deal with the cash flow and all that and the back and forth, it's it's generally what I'm seeing is most people planning to get that forgiveness application in uh, within the the ten month uh, window there um, after the end of the covered period, so that they don't have to trip the. Um, you know, the need to start making the payments. And uh, again, just as a reminder, and I'm kind of laying the groundwork a little bit, right? I think most people are, are comfortable with the fact that it's obviously with the bank and you're going to be going through the forgiveness process. And what I generally say is because every bank has to do a good faith review before it goes to the SBA and then they sign off on it, remit the funds back to the bank and, and uh, the loan's forgiven. But um, because of the good faith review is a bank by bank approach, there's, there are some nuances and differences between the banks and how that's handled. And so I, I always generally say, you know, start with make, making sure that you're able to get in and, and signed up and, um, and do the forgiveness application. And then, you know, there's going to be, be some differences in how the portal looks because every bank um, set it up for themselves um, and for their customers. Um, so, and to interface with the SBA. So, so that's something to keep in mind uh, as well. I will say that um, there, I, I know a number of, of uh, institutions are really trying to direct their, their attention towards the PPP round two, uh, which we're gonna dig into here in just a minute. Um, and so as a result, many are uh, maybe hitting the pause button on accepting forgiveness applications. So that might be another reason why applications aren't uh, going in right now. So just keep that in mind that maybe there's a little bit of a pause there in terms of the forgiveness piece and getting that done. So now we've laid the, the, the groundwork on the PPP and, and even what led to the change and all the legislation that got here. Let's talk about a change because there's some pretty big things starting with our first item here, which is something, and I've kind of put them into buckets here of, uh, you know, what changed for everybody? What changed for just PPP one? What changed for PPP two? And, and we'll go from there. But what changed for everybody 
And this is retroactive back to the beginning of the enactment of the, of the CARES Act, so March 27th of last year, uh, PPP loans are now, uh, the, the expenses are related to them. Uh, we, we always knew that the income was excluded and it was gonna be taxable income, but they were silent on the deductions and that became an issue with the IRS that basically ultimately said, well, um, because it's not addressed, it's essentially um, attributable to tax exempt income. And as a result of that, you don't get your deductions. So you'd have a disallowance of your deductions. Well, now again, retroactive back to the beginning of the program, you get your full tax deduction for all of your expenses, which are for most people payroll. Um, and um, you're, you're able to get those deductions in, in 2020. So again, if we're talking about PPP one loans or in 2021 uh, for that matter, if you're getting a, a PPP one or a PPP two, and that's, that's how I'm gonna refer to them as PPP one and two. It's not technically the name, but I think that's the way a lot of people like to refer to them. Uh, but I, the way I like to frame this up is say that, let's just say you had a million dollar PPP loan. And uh, you didn't qualify for any of this, uh, these other changes we're talking about, not eligible maybe for a PPP round two loan or this employee retention credit. Um, at the very least, you you did just get about a $370,000, if you're in the top tax bracket, um, additional benefit as a result of this law that was signed into uh, effect at the end of December. And it, the reason is the deductibility, because before you had to add back those expenses, and 370,000 is something 37% the top individual tax rate for a pass through business right now. Um, so on the federal side, that would have, you know basically cost you that much in, in taxes. Now um, you're gonna get those deductions. And uh, there's also an ability to, when you're in a pass through situation and most of the businesses that I work with are in a pass through environment. So an S corporation or a, uh, an LLC or a, a partnership, taxes a partnership and they, um, you, you know, you're passing that through and there's this concept of basis you have to deal with. And they, they did give us, although there's some devils in the details a little bit, and we'll maybe need some additional guidance on it. Um, but, you know, some, I guess, some issues if maybe you didn't have basis coming in, but you do get a step up in basis to allow you to get the benefit of these additional deductions. So, so it's a big deal, uh, I, I think. I, I, you know, it seems very straightforward to say it's tax deductible now, these deductions, but our expenses rather. But it's a big deal. And, and it's perhaps even a bigger deal because there are changes under the CARES Act that also allow for uh, net operating losses that are generated in 2020 to be carried back five years. So generally speaking, where we were before is you, you, you couldn't go backwards with net operating losses. You could only go forward. Well, this would generate potentially a net operating loss you can carry it back five years and the tax rates were actually higher five years ago. Well, five years ago from 2020, so 2015, than they are um, in the current environment. So you can actually carry back and, um, and monetize that, that loss uh, much faster in terms of the tax benefit and at a higher rate potentially as well. So that's something I absolutely think you should be talking about and thinking about that's in conjunction with all of this from a tax planning perspective. So um, let's talk about some of those other changes. So again, so changes for everyone, this applies to everybody. If you had a, um, an EIDL loan, so that's a different SBA program where they had these loans, these e uh, economic injury disaster loans. Um, there was an advance up to $10,000. It was $1,000 per employee um, that they were providing. They actually did run out of that funding, so they're no longer providing that. But if you got that originally under the PPP, you had to add that back in your forgiveness. So basically you couldn't be forgiven, the, we'll call it the 10 grand that you got. Well, they changed that in December and now you can. And uh, the SBA is working with the lenders to get the money back uh, to the borrowers. Uh, so that's something that's uh, in process. And from my understanding, you don't necessarily have to do anything to get that. It just will be adjusted. So if you were already forgiven and not forgiven of the, the 10 grand, but if you're doing an application now, it's, it's now removed from the application and um, you don't have to add that back. So that's a nice little benefit. So my next bucket I'm going to put everything in is, is again, talking about PPP2 or, again, second draw loans, as they're technically called. And um, and actually, Dan and I, were, we were chatting a little bit here before we kind of got on the line. And he's asking, hey, uh, Damien, you know, what's the, um, you know, what are you seeing? Are you seeing the interest that we did for round one? And I kind of mentioned that there in passing that, you know, we had, a, a, you know, the first two weeks there, the initial appropriation was, was burned through. Um, and so they did additional funding, obviously, to expand the program. Um, well, we're not seeing nearly the, um, the, I'll say the demand for it, or the, and the loans aren't getting drawn down nearly as quickly as they did in round one. Um, right now, I think it's a little under half have been um, have been administered. And uh, right now, the program goes to the end of, of March. And there's maybe a potential for it to get additional dollars directed to it under this next round of relief as well. So, so we'll kind of see where that goes. But, but I think the big thing to keep in mind is 
that, um, and we'll get into maybe the reason here in a second, but you know, you don't need to be in a rush and a hurry to get one. And in fact, if you qualify for the employer retention credit, I would actually argue you should wait. If you haven't already gotten a PPP round two loan to wait, to get it. And so I'll, I'll put a pin in that and I'm going to come back to it and I'll tell you why, but uh, to get a PPP two loan. And maybe again, this is perhaps the reason why we're not seeing as many of them. They, they did really gear it towards the hardest hit small businesses. So they took the original, you had to have 500 or fewer employees. And this is on an affiliated basis. Um, and they took it down to 300 uh, employees for round two. And again, well, this is where the kick in comes in. You've got these affiliation rules. These are SBA rules, not IRS rules on, um, on, you know, whether or not you have to look to the ownership and other related entities for calculating that 300. Uh, but then you also have to show a decrease or a decline in your revenue. And this is top line. So this is gross receipts that we're talking about. But if 25% or more in any quarter in, um, in 2020 compared to the same quarter in 2019, and uh, there, there's, a, again, something they gave us in the guidance that maybe is meant to be helpful, but I think is also confusing, but it's any quarter. And so a lot of times what I'm seeing is you, you, you'll see it in maybe a second quarter because that's when the, 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 um, the pandemic really kind of took hold and, and shut everything down or shut many things down. And so you'd see the decrease there. So um, you do have to have that though. And then we'll get into some of the weeds on that. The loans are also smaller this time around. Instead of 10 million is the max, it's, it's 2 million. And it's based on the, and I can actually say in many cases, the exact same 2.5 months of average uh, payroll. Because if you got a PPP round one loan, you can actually use the same payroll that you'd already submitted uh, for the loan uh, the first go round if you want, or it's from the last calendar year. So you can you can redo that. Um, something I'll mention on that 300 that I've, I've gotten questions on, um, it, it is as of the previous calendar year. So um, you, you, you couldn't strategically go in and, and say, well, I'm going to get under the 300 so I can qualify for a PPP2 loan. Uh, it, it doesn't work because the, the, the number and the count that matters was already established as of this point in time. So you can't kind of plan around the 300 at this point in time. Um, there, there are some limitations as with anything, right? It, it can, we talked about the you know, requirements, but you're, you aren't eligible if uh, you were eligible to get a first draw loan and you didn't get one. So basically what that means is if you didn't get a PPP one loan and you're eligible for a PPP two, you got to go back and get that um, that that PPP one loan first, get that taken care of, and then get the PPP two, which may be practically hard to do uh, because of the fact that you have to have eight weeks uh, to get your um, your covered period to run, at least at a, at a minimum. The the interesting thing here is that you don't have to necessarily be forgiven of your first round loan. You just had to have spent the loan, or you will have spent the loan by the time you get the PPP two loan. Um, so many banks, and, and, and I think the, the SBA hasn't really been clear on it, um, are saying, well, you've got to wait at least eight weeks before you can get uh, a second draw loan if uh, you know, you're in that situation. So, so that's something uh, to note there. Uh, you can also only get one uh, PPP2 loan. Um, if you are permanently closed because of the pandemic and whatnot, then you aren't eligible this go-round either. Uh, and then you also aren't eligible if you receive a grant uh, for the, the Shuttered Venue Operators Program, which is another SBA program they have not rolled out yet, but was created under this December bill, the spending bill. So um, there's it, it's, it's a little challenging if you, if you apply that. We're not going to dig into that. I'd be happy to answer questions, but it's challenging in the sense that you won't be able to get both. So you kind of have to decide if you're going to do PPP2 or the Shuttered Venue Program. And we don't really have all the details on that program yet. So it's a little hard to know, but they're those are mutually exclusive programs. All right, so we talked about the decrease. So what what do you what do you get in there? Uh, it's twenty five percent or more. It's gross receipts. Generally, it's the same method of uh, how you report them for tax purposes. So cash or accrual, depending on that method of accounting. Uh, you, again, it's listed here on the slide. The things you get to exclude. You do get to exclude your forgiven PPP round one loan. So that's that's beneficial. Uh, but generally speaking, we do think you have to include things like other CARES Act related or Relief Act uh, related provisions like the provider relief funds and, and things like that in the, in the healthcare space. Those generally we do think need to be included again, absent the SBA coming back and giving us something different. Um, there are special rules for acquisitions and dispositions, and I'll just leave it at that because they're they're a little bit uh, there's a little bit there. But know that if you if you did anything in 2020 in terms of adding or subtracting to the business, that kind of changes the math. 
All right. So we already mentioned the, the first point here. Um, talked about the second point as well because I think those are, are those are items. But here's the one that gets confusing. I think is I said it's any quarter in in uh, 2020 compared to the same quarter in 2019 that you have this decline, right? Well, they also said well if you were down 25 percent or more year over year for all of 2020, you can you can prove it based on your tax returns and use that. Um, and if that's an easier thing for you. Uh, because I'll say that, you know, proving this 25% more decline has created a lot of questions. The guidance isn't entirely clear, but they did issue some guidance on what you need to submit and whatnot. Um, but essentially, if you can get there for any quarter, you're fine. You don't, you didn't have to get there for the whole year. And I think that's the point where people get confused and say, well, I don't meet this decline because I didn't, I wasn't down all, all year. Um, but again, it can just be Q2 and that's fine. Uh, so it's something to keep in mind if you're thinking maybe you didn't qualify. Um, again, talked about the payroll. Um, we have basically the way I've been describing it is you have the same exact rules that we had in terms of the overall requirements and you know some of those initial things we mentioned, the limitations on the forgiveness and in higher spending at the caps and, and all that. There was a sl slight nuance with some of the uh, the ability to use the size standards that the SBA has in place. So that would that would allow you in, in round one if you had more than 500 employees. If you could still qualify under the SBA size standards, you were able to get a loan. Um, in the round two, those size standards don't apply. So basically, if you if you are over the 300 limit on employees, you're not able to get a, a PPP two loan. Um, and similar to round one, um, again, so it's two million per. Uh, it was 10 million per for for round one, right? Uh, that a corporate group can only get uh, basically two x the amount there. All right, um, kind of last little points here on, on the round two loans. Um, and then again, feel free to chime in with questions and whatnot as you go along. Um, and I'll mention maybe some of the, uh, the, the challenges we're seeing, but uh, you need the same certifications. And I think this is a big one. So, you know, when I listed the requirements earlier that you had the decline and you only had the 300 employees, the other thing to keep in mind is that actually you have to um, also have the economic need. So the economic uncertainty necessitates the need for the loan. It's the same thing we had as a certification on the, the application for the loan. We had it on round one. We have it for round two. A, a Maybe a difference here is in round one, if we recall, we got to, it was May, and the SBA actually issued a safe harbor and said anybody below two billion bucks uh, in an affiliated group uh, or on a standalone basis, we're going to assume that you made that, that, uh, that requirement. So we're not even going to look at it. You, your safe harbor, you're, you're, you made it. We're not going to review it. Anybody over 2 million, we're gonna review it. And there's actually a questionnaire that they're asking for. And um, again, another common question I'm getting is, well, what are you hearing about loans that are over 2 million bucks and, and those getting forgiven? And uh, the answer is there, there really hasn't been much movement. The, the SBA, I think, took a pause on, on those as there was a change in the administration to kind of see if there was gonna be a change in approach perhaps. Um, they've been very quiet about it, but there have not been loans over 2 million really getting forgiven. I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, but we do know, or necessarily, right? Um, we, we do know that they're asking for this loan questionnaire. And so what I've been saying for anybody that's that's looking at a PPP2 loan of any amount is to at least look at that questionnaire because that's the, what the SBA has communicated to us to say that, well, these are the sorts of things we think you would need to consider if you're, um, you know, you had this this economic need for the loan. You had the, you know, this necessity for the loan because of the the economic risk. And so I would start there and peruse that before getting the, the PPP2 loan, if you're concerned about meeting the requirement. Because in many cases, I think, you know, like I said, the example that common times you're getting it, you're qualifying on the 25% or more decline based off of Q2 2020. Well, maybe you had a, a rock solid Q4, you know, and, and hopefully you did. Um, and then that, that maybe begs the question about this necessity uh, because you're, you're making the certification as the day you get the loan. So, you know, you could, uh, there, there certainly are factors to point to and, you know, variants and some of the challenges we've had, but um, you, you need to, you need to kind of think through that. Um, what I'll mention again on the, on the forgiveness. So maybe some, some good news I'll say is uh, of the loans that have been forgiven, uh, of roughly a third of the round one loans have been forgiven. I, I, I'm, 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 personally not aware of any one over 2 million that's been forgiven. I've heard of one or two nationally uh, that have been forgiven, um, but um, these were very, very early on and there hasn't really been much movement there. But of the loans that have been forgiven, um, about it's, it's, in, it's 99 in some per points percentage uh, of them are being fully forgiven. So, um, so that's, I think that's very, very good news for those that are maybe nervous about the forgiveness process. 
I would say, you know, it's a lot of the banks maybe are not able to get in and, and, and do them because they're diverting resources to uh, the forgiveness application. That is, they're diverting resources to PPP round two and helping with that. And um, so maybe you can't get the application in. I, I wouldn't get nervous about it, but I do think it's something my, my advice has been get the ducks in a row, you know, get through whatever year in close you have to do and, and all that, you know, deal with the tax returns and, and whatnot. But, if, but getting everything in order so you can do the forgiveness is going to be very, very huge. Um, but before you do, if you haven't submitted your forgiveness application, listen to what I have to say here a bit about the employer retention credit, because it matters. And I wouldn't, this is, I wouldn't submit that forgiveness application for a round one loan until I considered the employer retention credit. One last note um, on the PPP2 uh, second draw loans here. Um, there, there's been, I think a lot of, uh, I've, I've heard of voices frustration, but the SBA did uh, turn back on some of the, the, the protections that they put in place when they're handing out loans that perhaps they had turned off in the round one loans. So they, everybody's experience was being able to, uh, A, try to beat the clock and get the loan as quickly as possible. So, you know, rushing to get it as quickly as, as they could and B, that they got it very, very quickly. Well, neither are the case uh, this, this go round. A, I already mentioned the money's not going as quickly. So they're not expecting the money's going to run out. So I don't think there's a rush to get it. And two, I think it takes some patience because uh, the SBA is, there's a number of codes they have. Uh, I think that, that on the first initial pass, it's like 40 or so codes, I think, that can automatically kick somebody out. And that's before the SBA even reviews it. And then once it gets in the SBA system, I think there's another 60 codes that they are saying, you know, that's been flagged for something. Again, not necessarily a, necessarily a bad thing, um, but that there's something that needs to get resolved. So I think patience is the word I would use to describe um, PPP2 round, uh, PP2 loans at this point in time. All right, so I'm gonna shift gears here and go to the some of the other changes before we get to this employer retention credit. Um, so I mentioned again, the changes for all, right? The deductibility issue, that's big for me. Second bucket, draw two loans, that's big too, right? Um, but again, knowing about some of these things, if I mentioned you can get a PPP round one loan again, they reopen the window. So you can, you can do that and you can, you can participate in that now. Um, it, but it, it does close at the end of March. And um, I think what I'll do is again, I, we'll, we have the slides, we'll provide them. So I'm not going to go, you know, I'll leave some of these. I'm not going to get into the, the weeds on them um, because they, they find them to be a little bit, you know, if they apply to you, they apply to you. If they don't, they don't. Um, but uh, something to keep in mind, and this is actually a, a, a change, and I should mention this too for the PPP too. Um, we, we saw a change for farmers and ranchers with the December bill. Um, basically, it's more favorable to borrowers and being able to get a larger loan. And they announced, the, the Biden administration announced on Monday that they were going to make similar changes for uh, independent contractors and sole practitioners and uh, or proprietors, rather, uh, the file schedule C. And we're expecting, we don't know the details yet, but we're expecting it to be similar to those, those three sub bullet points above there for the um, ranchers and farmers. Um, we're expecting to see something similar there where you're, you're using gross income instead of net. So that can be a very good thing in terms of the amount of your loan that you can get. Don't have the details yet, um, but that's, that's gonna be forthcoming here. Uh, something else I should mention on the PPP too, that I'd be remiss if I didn't, and actually goes into effect today, they're putting a, a two week hold on the PPP two loans. Uh, to say that the, uh, they're only allowing those with 20 or fewer employees to apply for the next two weeks. Uh, and so that, you know, again, that's just rolling out today. And so that that also might further the reason why if, if you haven't gotten one or if you're talking to somebody that would be getting one, they wouldn't be able to get it now because uh, if they're over that 20 number, they're really trying to get the small um, the small uh, businesses served as, as part of the, the program right now. So that's that's another change that we're keeping an eye on. Changes that just apply to PPP one loans. So you can go back and get supplemental funding if you didn't get all of it the first round. Um, the rules were kind of evolving. They were building the plane as it was in the air. And so maybe the, you, you didn't get as much loan as you could have. Well, you can go back and get a supplemental as part of this round one. You can also go back and get, do a do-over, which is basically maybe you you got your loan and you were worried about that, that economic necessity issue uh, that we talked about and you gave the money back. Well, you can go back and do a do-over and get that now. Uh, you can also get it if you're a 501c6 organization, of certain organizations, and certainly housing co-ops and newspapers and broadcasters and radio stations are also eligible. So you can go back in or can go and get one now. But again, have to get around one before you can get around two. And the final, final thing here on PPP uh, I'll mention is they did add four new buckets of non-payroll costs. So you still have to fill up your 60% on payroll. 
But then you can um, you can use these other non-payroll costs, and they added these four other buckets. and And I made this comment in passing and said most people use it all on the payroll, and that's because you you have 24 weeks or up to to spend the money, but it's based off of two and a half months of, of payroll, right? So in theory, you're you're almost you know three four times if your headcount and your payroll and all that stayed the same, the amount of payroll that you incurred in the window than you qualified for. So you have more than enough payroll. Um, well, there's this employer retention credit that um, most people passed over the first go round because it was mutually exclusive. It used to be that if you had a forgiven PPP loan, you couldn't take advantage of the employer retention credit. Well, that's changed with this December bill. And so now you can get it, but the catch is you can't use the same wages for both. So that might mean, this is why I was saying, put a pause on hitting your, uh, you know, send on your, your forgiveness application if you haven't already done it. And the reason is that maybe you want to fill up with some of these other non-payroll costs and not use all your payroll so you can save it for the employer retention credit. Um, so that's the, um, that's the big, big takeaway there. Uh, but these four buckets are pretty broad and, and they cover a number of things. Um, you know, the, the, the names are sort of explanatory, but again, I can dig into them um, more if there's questions on them. So you know, I'll take a quick pause as we, we shift gears to the employer retention credit, just to see if there were any questions um, or, or anything that comes to mind. So Damien, there wasn't really an additional one in the chat, but uh, I had a couple of things that sure. people asked me. Um, you mentioned the larger loans there, you haven't really seen any, um, forgiveness in general. There, there may be a handful out there nationwide. Um, but, uh, you know, I think a lot of them are coming up to the 90 day or exceeding the response that the guideline is for the SBA to respond to those forgiveness requests. Yeah. Um, is there any average number of days past 90 days or any way to kind of speed up the SBA or, you know, it's, it's just kind of a wait, wait in here. Yeah. It's kind of a wait, wait and see, unfortunately. Um, you know, they, they, they get, like you said, they gave the 90 day window. Um, there's not really necessarily a penalty for them for not. And I'm, and I'm aware of situations where they've already kind of exceeded that. Um, I don't know that there really is an average. I mean, I, I know that the questionnaire was coming out back in October. And so I know basically, I mean, if you were getting the questionnaire, that's after the, you've you've given it to the bank, right? And you knew this well, Dan, for the good good faith review. Then from there, it goes to the SBA. At that, that's when it triggers this questionnaire. And I was getting them back in October. Um, and so we're we're uh, kind of at that ninety days. Um, so yeah, we're at a wait and see. We're hearing that they're they're trying to speed up the process and and get more done. Um, but um, yeah, it's a great question. Unfortunately, I don't have a great answer for. Uh, <laughs> nothing in the December bill changed anything about that. Um, and we're still waiting on, uh, you know, where that lands, I guess, ultimately. Yeah, I guess adding a whole new program that when they're not done with the first one probably didn't uh, help. Yeah. I don't think that helped things. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see, we do have a couple. Um, one, if you do not apply for PPP one by 331, does that mean the opportunity um, is unable to apply for any type of PPP loan? Unless they reopen the program, yes. So once you get past March March 31, that, that's when the, when the program will close under the current law. So so I would say that that should be the target, but there there is word and maybe possibility that they would extend it out further. Like I said, they're, re, you know, they're gonna be looking at appropriating additional funds to the program under this $1.9 trillion bill that's going through right now. Um, so I think there's ex some thought that they would extend it beyond that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then we have, uh, if entities have access to liquidity through other facilities, is PPP still an option or should PPP be only after exhausting the availabilities first and assuming those facilities are not detrimental to the organization to access? That's a really great question. Yeah. Um, so the, the challenge with this necessity requirement is they really did not define it. Um, and, and this is kind of on the legal side, uh, more than the accounting and the, and the, and all that side of things. Um, and there's, there's some concern that, that there's some gray area in the middle there. I mean, the little, very little they've told us is you don't necessarily need to look outside of the, um, of the organization for 
and then they were talking about publicly traded, you know, kind of C corps in that context. Um, that you don't need to look outside of the organization. The question about facilities is a good one, but I think in many cases, and there's been a number of I, I know um, business organizations that have have uh, in their their groups that have put out letters basically saying, you know, this is we feel that you know, for example, if you were to draw down on the loan, the facility or the the facility, the credit facility, that that would be detrimental. And so I think that that's what I'm more commonly seeing is that it would be considered detrimental to, you know, for example, if, you know, you have a bonding requirement that that would be detrimental there. Um, so I can't tell you with, with certainty that the SBA won't interpret that because we haven't seen it, it um, finalized, but I think there's, there's a number of people that do feel that, uh, that, you know, there's definitely a case to be made for why, you know, drawing into the facility wasn't something that would be required or, ne or necessary. Um, but it's a, it, it sort of remains to be seen. But I would say for those that are under the $2 million mark for the PPP1 loans, and again, there is no mark for the PPP2 loans, um, that um, it, 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 I want to say it's not necessarily a moot point, but it's a point that you don't necessarily have to worry about because of the fact that the SBA has already said they're not going to assess the, um, that necessity requirement on those, um, those organizations and those borrowers. Um, okay, I think we hit all the PPP questions. Um, there was one uh, ERC related question that I'll throw out there, but you I'm maybe covering that. So yeah, uh, is there an income reduction test for the ERC? So Great question. Yeah, it's a good good segue here. Tease it up. So let's yeah, let's get into this ERC because uh, again, I think the biggest notion that we have to kind of erase from our minds is that you you can't take advantage of this and the PPP um, because you now can. Um, and th there is actually a requirement um, for, to have a reduction, but not necessarily. Maybe there's a there's a there's so there's an either or way to get there. So let's talk a little bit about what it is, and then I'll and I'll I'll get there for you, uh, Maggie. So the um, so the, it's a refundable payroll credit. In 2020, and, and this is really how you have to think of it. It's 2020, and we're going to talk about that now, and then we're going to get to 2021 because they, they're, they're different rules. So in 2020, it's a refundable payroll credit of up to 50% of qualified wages. So, uh, and those are capped at $10,000. So it's basically a $5,000 per employee credit if you can meet the requirements and qualify and have eligible wages um, that you get. And, it, and it's, it is, like I said, refundable. So this is available to all organizations, big or small, for-profit, not-for-profit. Um, it's, it's perhaps a little harder for larger uh, employers to get there, but, um, and we'll talk about why, but, but generally anybody and everybody that has payroll can take advantage of this uh, because it's, it's, it's refundable against the payroll. Um, and, and so some of these changes that we're going to talk about, there's some retroactive changes here, like the fact that you, you know, it's no longer mutually exclusive with the PPP. Um, so they made it retroactive. So you actually go back and your mechanism for doing this is on the form 941, which is the payroll tax return. And you can go back and file an amended return for 2020, which the IRS. So I mentioned earlier that we were looking at SBA rules. Now we're looking at IRS rules and, uh, on this. So the, um, the IRS has not told us yet how to go back and amend the, the prior year 2020 situation. Um, but we're kind of keeping an eye out for that. Um, so, so the wages and, and also including wages, and this is a big one to mention, is qualified health plan expenses also count. And they're going to come in when, for some of the larger employers in particular. Um, so we'll, we'll dig into those a bit. But, but here's the answer to your question um, about the, de the decline. So in 2020, you can get there either by having a decline in a significant decline in gross receipts. Actually, I guess it's, that's a 2020 or 2021 issue. It's just the, what constitutes significant de decline changed in the two years. So that's one way, or you are fully or partially shut down by a government order. And this tends to be the biggest area of, uh, uh, I won't say it's gray because they've actually issued, they being the IRS has issued a number of FAQs on it and what they, what they consider to constitute a shutdown. And it is very specific as to, you know, it has to be a, a, a federal um, or state uh, government order. Um, so CDC would count so that, that you were actually shut down. But and then you look and say, well, you can be partially shut down. Well, you know, what does that mean? And, you know, that's ultimately where I think some of the, the, the nuance comes in and kind of looking at that. So we'll, we'll unpack that. But what was the decline in 2020? Well, it's, uh, it's, it's 50%. Is what it is. So you're looking at, so let's just say Q2 of 2020, you're going to go back to 2020, 2019. And if your gross receipts went down 50% or more, 
um, year over year, year over year from that quarter, uh, then you, uh, uh, that you're eligible for that quarter uh, to, to be able to take the credit. And you can start taking it immediately if you're in, a, in, a, in a quarter when you're eligible. Um, this will be more of a 2022 thing. I'm sorry, 2021 thing. Um, but uh, you are eligible to get it immediately. You can get an advance on it. There's a form for doing it, although I found practically not a lot of people end up doing that. Um, but you're looking at kind of the same thing we were talking about earlier for the PPP. You're looking at a decline in gross receipts. Uh, you're looking at your method of accounting. And um, then there's there's some interesting rules here on on you know what's in there and what's not in there and what counts and what doesn't and we're still getting getting a little bit of guidance there but um, you, you do have to have the, the decline if you're going that route but again you don't necessarily have to as long as you had the the shutdown um, and the shutdown I'd say I, I generally look at it and say look at the FAQs. Um, on the on the IRS website, you go to irs.gov and they can walk through some specific situations. I can walk through some specific situations as well. But basically, if you're able to continue operations in a comparable manner to what you were doing when you were in the office, then you weren't partially or fully shut down. Um, and this would apply. So, you know, if you were considered essential and you were still able to, to operate um, in, in the business, even if you chose not to, but you could do your comparable work from home, that doesn't qualify. And the example I would give is is like myself. Um, you know, we've we've moved to pretty much a, a remote uh, environment here. Um, I I can still do my work efficiently. Uh, maybe you could say there's an argument about efficiency, and, and efficiency actually doesn't come into play. So I'll I'll even correct myself on that because many people would say, well, you know, I'm not as effective, so that should count, right? No, it, it's it, it, but it's if it's comparable to how I can I, I operate and function, then that's not necessarily a partial shutdown. But you can have a division maybe, and it has to be a, 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 a basically a, a significant portion of your business that was sh uh, shut down. Uh, so maybe that means that, you know, for restaurants, that's a good example of saying, well, indoor dining was shut down. Well, that's a significant portion of the business. Doesn't mean that the revenue was significantly down. It just means that a significant portion was was shut down. You could still do outdoor dining, but you couldn't do indoor. Well, that would, that would count and that can get you there. And that's where I think a lot of times you're seeing it, you know, in restaurants and those are good, good. Uh, examples of people that will qualify. Um, but it's very important to, to keep an eye on this. And I think there's some people that maybe are looking to be aggressive with it. I would, I would uh, urge some caution on being aggressive and pushing it um, because you do, um, it, it, you're, you're basically dealing with payroll taxes here and the IRS doesn't take too kindly to those that don't um, deposit the, the payroll taxes when they're supposed to. So I would, uh, uh, that's a kind of a generalization, but it's a, it, there's, there's penalties that, that kick in there that you don't really want to mess with. So, um, you know, I think talking it through and, and really identifying your fact pattern uh, is, is, is the key there. Uh, but again, if you're not fully or partially shut down and you're able to get there from the gross receipts as defined here on the slide, well, then you got a, um, you know, a little bit of more, a straighter path there uh, to get there. So then here's the next piece. So that you had to be an eligible em employer um, to be able to, to take this credit. Next, you have to have qualifying wages. And that's what you're taking the credit on. And whether or not you had qualifying wages depends on, in 2020, whether or not you had 100 uh and this is the line of sand, uh, employees or not. And it's it's full-time employees. There is some debate as to whether, because uh, they looked at some existing legislation and pulled it to definition kind of not clearly. Um, there's some some debate as to whether that's uh, you have to put in uh, full-time equivalents in there. Um, I, the, the IRS FAQs actually say that you only have to put in full-time and 40 is considered full-time for this purpose. Um, so, you know, you're, I'm sorry, 30, because it's ACA rules, it's considered full-time. So you, you're looking at, you're looking at that. Um, there's some debate again as to whether or not those partial, um, you know, part time need to be uh, included. So, um, and uh, Otis, you're dropping off. Thanks for stopping by. Um, got that. I finally got the chat pulled up. I, sometimes when you share the screen, it gets it takes a bit to get there. So, uh, but anyway, so you get the. There's some debate about that. But if you're under the 100, basically means any employee counts. But if you're over the 100, you had to pay them to do nothing. And that's that's the kind of in, in, uh, summarizing way to say it, uh, but it's basically paying them to do nothing. You 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 know. So a good example I have is um, know somebody that has a they operate a number of gyms across the country, and um, in each location they have a you know at least a, a manager and that you know, the kind of the team there. Well, they're keeping them on board, uh, doing nothing in, until they're able to reopen. In some locations they have, in others they haven't. But they want to be able to you know 
turn on a dime to be able to reopen those locations the second they're able, able to. So they're keeping the manager, you know, on, on payroll. Um, even though they're over the employee count, there's those wages would be eligible for this, uh, this consider this, this credit here. So, um, all right, we talked about the average FTE calculation and, and, and how you do it. I guess we talked about what it is, but then you're averaging it out to do it. So you're looking at 30 more hours um, and, and it's what's considered, or if you provide 130 more hours during a month, that's what's considered full-time for this for this purpose. So again, we're, we're looking at how to be eligible as an employer, then you have to have qualifying wages. And we talked about what those are generally. Now, what isn't included in, in, in um, qualified wages? Well, if you received another credit, so, so for example, the Families First Coronavirus Relief Act, uh, there's some credits there. If you, you use the wages for that, you can't use it. Um, if you're using it for another credit, basically, you can't double dip. If you're using it for the PPP, you, you can't double dip. The other interesting area where it's a little bit debatable is if, if it's um, paid to certain relatives or individuals that own more than 50%. We know they don't count, but the question is, what about the owners themselves? Um, it depends on how you def do, do you look at these uh, attribution rules, uh, aggregation rules under the IRS. They're not new, um, but uh, there's some debate as to whether or not owners would qualify. Um, it's not it's not explicit, so I think some are, are going on the side of saying, well, then I think owners and their spouses would count, but there are definitely some that are saying that, no, you can't take owners for this purpose. Um, so um, so that's that, that, I guess that's consideration there. Um, work opportunity tax credit, can't do that. The, the taxes themselves don't count as well. So that's kind of what counts as wages. And I'm gonna go ahead and I'll go ahead and feed, uh, field your, your uh, question here, uh, Jim, on uh, basically, for, so for impacts of government orders limiting commerce, uh, what about the indirect side effects uh, or the indirect effects of shutdowns such as food manufacturers who are impacted uh, by restaurant closures? It can, if it shuts down your, your business. The issue is, is they, they basically, and this is where it's maybe not as favorable the way the IRS has interpreted it, you, you can't say, and even for the purpose of this wages to say that, well, you know, I could do, I'll use it in my example, you know, I could turn out a hundred tax returns in a day before, I, I can't, that's, that's, that would be a crazy day. The uh, hundred tax returns before, but now I can only do 50. So I'm 50% less efficient. So therefore I, um, you know, I, that my wages should count. You can't do that. Uh, and you also, you know, if you were still able to operate, you, you can't do that. But there are, there are, a, if you're, if, if you're directly, re, um, impacted because of a closure um, that can get you there. Um, th in your example, we'd have to probably look at, it would probably be specific to, you know, exactly which resident being able to directly draw that correlation. So I don't think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a clear path, but I think it's a potential path to get there under the closure. So I would, I would say definitely um, take a look at that. Um, I'd be happy to chat more about that with you as well. All right. So uh, we talked about what doesn't count. Um, let's flip over and talk about what happened with this bill at the end of the year, aside from it being retroactive. What they also did is they, they expanded it and extended it into 2021. So Q1, Q2 at this point, if the, the bill we were talking about, that $1.9 trillion bill gets through uh, and get that gets enacted, it would actually take it out to the end of 2021. We'd have this credit. Um, they also said, well, group health expenses uh, would be considered qualified wages. And that's significant, I think, because in many cases, what I'm hearing, especially with manufacturers that I work with, uh, that are over the, the limit in terms of employees, they maybe they furloughed, but they continue to pay health ex expenses. And so those can potentially count, um, you know, in that, in that window of time. So there's an, an opportunity for you, uh, even though that maybe the wage, you don't have qualified wages, the wages themselves, because again, you, they, you weren't paying them not to work because uh, you weren't paying them. You still were in a way because you're paying their health insurance. So that, that kind of counts uh, from that perspective. So um, that's something to keep, keep an eye on. So what else did they do for 2021? Well, instead of uh, being a 50% credit, they up, upped it to a 70% credit of wages and that's per quarter. So, you know, right, that's basically $7,000 um, that you can get per quarter. So it'd be $14,000 in 2021 if you qualified in both quarters. Or again, if they extend it out to the end of the year, it could be 28 grand per employee. So we're talking some big numbers, especially if you start multiplying it by numbers of employees. The other thing that they did was they took that 100 limit and they put it up to a 500. So that means a lot more employers will be eligible um, for it. And, um, and I think I, they skipped over the point um, in there, or maybe it's not in the slides here, but the, oh, that's the second point there. Um, they took the 50% decline down to a 20% decline. So again, it's easier to get there to qualify. It's easier to have wages now and the credit's bigger. 
So it's it's a big deal. You really need to be taking a second look at it. And and when you're looking at the decline, though, the, the thing to keep in mind for 2021 is you're still using 19 as a base year. That was the starting point. Basically, they're looking at it saying, what were you before COVID? What are you now? Um, so you're taking Q1 2021 20, uh, and comparing it to Q1 2019. You are able to look and elect to say that, well, if in Q4 2020, I had a decline of 20% or more compared to Q4 2019, you can use that and, and elect to say that, well, then that would qualify me for Q1 2021 because we're in the middle of Q1 2021. So how would you possibly know if you're going to make it? Um, so you can go, you can use that. And that's allowed some people to start taking that credit immediately. So I would uh, start looking at that in terms of a, an ability to have um, basically cash flow pretty quickly. So an example here real quick, I guess, um, again, kind of just shows the difference of the same exact fact pattern because of the expansion. It went from a $5,000 employee, uh, per employee credit um, in 2020 under the CARES Act to $11,200 in this example credit in uh, 2020, 2021. So um, what I'll leave you with is maybe some flow charts. They're, they're kind of small, um, but this kind of walks it through. They're in the materials. I've, I've also got larger versions of them. I'd be happy to share with you as well, but it kind of talks about, okay, what is it for 2020? What is it for 2021? Um, so I think this is absolutely something to think about. There is some strategy here and how to do it. I think it's a combination of the two. I, and my big my big takeaways, if I'm, I'm going to land on here before kind of closing out with some some more questions, is you know, use patience when applying for those PPP round two loans. Don't apply for the forgiveness until you get the um, you, you evaluate this employer retention credit. And maybe, and I mentioned this point earlier, you don't want to get the PPP two loan right away because if you're in Q1 and you qualify right now, you want to you basically to kind of maximize your, your employer retention credit, you may want to wait a, a little bit. And so you can kind of fully get your full quarter of Q1 of uh, employer retention credit before getting the PPP2 loan, because you're once you do that, you're going to start using the wages for the PPP loan. Um, PPP, 100% tax-free loan is always going to be a better benefit than the employer retention credit. But if you can get both, then, then you really have got some some great benefits here. So um, again, we have a couple more minutes left. I, you know, happy to answer some questions. Uh, D, uh, Dan, if you have any questions, feel free to let me know, but I'll kind of maybe close with my contact information here uh, in the slide if you want to. Um, yeah, I, I think we hit most of the questions. I think there was one that um, um, we may have hit, but is the credit for each quarter that you qualify or is it one ERC for the entire year? So that, yeah, it's a great, great point. So in 2020, it's one $5,000 amount for the whole year. So if you got it all in Q2 and Q3, even if you had qualifying wages, you don't get any more. But in 2021, it's a per quarter credit. So you can get, you know, basically seven thousand dollars in Q1 and seven thousand dollars in Q2. So it's a, it becomes a much larger per employee benefit. Um, that's a great great question. And it looks like Amanda has a question here about uh, conflicting takes on uh, FAQ 59. Um, and and I would agree with you that there are definitely conflicting takes, and it all goes down to those aggregation rules and whether you have like reattribution. Um, I think a very literal reading of that language would tell you that the owners would not qualify. Um, but it's not direct and it's not included in the FAQ. And so I think there's also a, um, a reasonable conclusion to say that because the IRS didn't explicitly say that, they only say qualifying relatives, they didn't say the owners themselves, um, that that would be grounds for, for taking the credit. But I do think it's, it's probably worth noting that you know the IRS could come back and provide additional guidance and clarify that and, and prevent that. Um, but I, I think there is a, um, there would be support for, for taking that uh, by pointing to the FAQs. Thank uh, Damien here for uh, the insight today and, and BKD for being our sponsor.